Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Payne Fund, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here and also a proud member. And it's my pleasure to welcome Connie Pillich as part of our ongoing effort to put you, all of you, in conversation with the people shaping the future of our state and the people who hope to lead it, specifically the candidates for governor of the state of Ohio. In 2018, Ohioans will head to the polls to cast votes in races in all 16 congressional seats one Senate seat, and offices of Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, Secretary of State, Treasurer, and Auditor. Together, these roles comprise a large chunk of Ohio state and federal representation. This summer, Republican Lieutenant Governor Mary Taylor announced her candidacy for the governor's office at a city club forum. And at previous forums, we heard from Secretary of State John Husted, Attorney General Mike DeWine, who both have since announced their candidacy, along with Ohio Senator Joe Schiavone, who joined us as the first officially announced gubernatorial candidate. And joining us today is Connie Pillich. Ms. Pillich is an attorney, an Air Force veteran, and a former member of the Ohio House of Representatives. She's the youngest of five children. She grew up in a small town outside of Buffalo, New York. And after graduating from the University of Oklahoma, Ms. Pillich spent eight years on active duty in the Air Force, where she served time in Berlin during the Cold War and in support of Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield. I know what you're thinking. Like, it does not seem that she could possibly be that old. but. Um, this is her bio. You're not. She's not. Yeah. Um, there's apparently also a, a portrait of her in her attic that ages when she doesn't. She's. Thank you. Thank you. A little Oscar. <laughs> little little literature reference there. Thank you. Okay. She's a three-time recipient of the Air Force Commendation Medal and left active duty in 1991, having earned the rank of captain at the age of 16. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> After her military service, Ms. Pillich moved to Cincinnati where she graduated from law school, worked as a public defender, and later opened her own law practice. She was first elected to the Ohio House of Representatives for the 28th District in 2009, and over three terms representing uh, Greater Cincinnati. Greater Cincinnati, yes. She served on the Criminal Justice Committee, the Financial Institutions, Housing, and Urban Development Committee, and the Veterans Affairs Committee, where she was the ranking minority member. In 2014, Ms. Pillich took on incumbent Josh Mandel in the race for treasurer of Ohio. She announced her gubernatorial bid on March 13th of this year. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please welcome gubernatorial candidate Connie Pillich. Thank you for that very nice uh, introduction, Dan. I do turn 39 every year, and I pledge to do the same thing when I'm governor. So we're going to have a great infusion of youthful energy. <laughs> for a governor who just never admits what her real age is. So it is such a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for, for having me. To be a part of the City Club is really an honor because it, uh, I'm very excited about being a part of your 105th year, uh, providing a, a, a forum for recognizing our rights under the First Amendment, uh, honoring free speech and the exchange of different ideas. I was speaking with a couple of the uh, other attorneys in the room this morning about how we all should be supportive of this and be thankful of a, a forum like the City Club that allows us and, and in fact encourages it and requires this to continue to happen. So thank you so much for doing that and thank you for the series on the, the gubernatorial candidates. You know, running for governor is uh, a great endeavor and it's such a great privilege to have this opportunity but uh, it's also a great responsibility and I take it very seriously. So uh, this morning, pardon me, this afternoon, we're in the afternoon already, I want to talk a little bit about my background and the things that have motivated me to continue into public service, uh, a little bit about my vision, and then I do hope we will have a conversation about what concerns you. Because uh, I find it very important that I reach out and talk to the constituents, the people who are going to be uh, most invested in what we do in our future. So as, uh, as Dan mentioned, I did, uh, I did grow up, uh, I grew up in a steel town in the shadow of a very large steel mill. And that's where my grandpa worked. In fact, he built his house about two blocks from the gate. And um, 
That's, that's how he earned his living. And most of the dads we knew growing up worked at the steel mill. And it was, life was good. We had our own home. We had two cars, which was a really big event in those days. And we had a little bit of money in our pockets. And this was a great way to live. But all of that began to change when I was in high school. And the steel mill laid off 6,000 men. And then it laid off 10,000 men. And women, we all know that they didn't hire women in those days to do this kind of work. So this was devastating to our community, and it was, it was uh, very hard on our family, too, because the results of, of shutting down that mill rippled throughout the, throughout the whole region. So I turned to the military to get my education. And when I uh, finished college, I pinned on my second lieutenant bars on my shoulders. Well, my parents pinned them on for me. And I went off into the wild blue yonder, just very secure in my belief that the Air Force was going to show me the world. And right away, I went to Biloxi, Mississippi. <laughs> so I did spend eight years on active duty. I got my MBA along the way. I was stationed in West Berlin uh, at the height of the Cold War. It was still West Berlin at the time. And that was a, an incredible assignment because of the history, because of uh, learning about how another country operates and having a very important role in the governance of that occupied territory, but also because that was where we saw very clearly where East meets West. And uh, that division was marked by a, a very tall wall topped with barbed wire and surrounded by guard towers and backed up by Russian tanks and troops. So it, was a, it was, had a lot of uh, impact on me. I did settle in Cincinnati. That's where I met my husband, Paul. And we had our two children, Kayla and Talon. And you know, that's probably the most uh, important thing I've ever done, was having those kids. I became an attorney and opened my own law firm. And I represented people like my client, Jean, who was without health insurance and uh, had become disabled when her son was diagnosed with cancer. And she was desperate. She didn't know how she was going to pay for his medical treatment. So she got sucked in by a predatory lender who promised her the world, defrauded her, and pushed her into foreclosure. I got the call to represent Jean and others like her from legal aid. And I answered that call. I stepped in. I stood up to the predatory lenders. And I saved her house. About 10 years ago, I became very alarmed at the scandals that were going through our state government. And if you might, some of you might remember CoinGate. You might remember when the uh, workers' comp fund was pilfered of $200 million. You might remember that uh, 10 years ago, no one had done anything to respond to the Supreme Court telling us that our method of funding schools was unconstitutional and had been for some time. So I got very alarmed, and I decided I had to get involved. So I ran for state representative. And I won a seat that had been held by Republicans for 38 of the last 40 years. And as a state representative, I introduced the veterans bonus. And it was a small cash bonus to recognize those Ohioans who went off to Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, I also fought hard to keep children healthy and safe, to take care of our seniors to uh, protect the environment, and to rebuild our cities and first ring suburbs. And because of the work I did and because I was very accessible to my constituents, my district returned me to the legislature again and again. And I was really proud of that. Because it's, uh, it's not always a given that you're going to be returned in a, a Republican district. But in 2014, I chose to not run for my final term. Uh, instead, I ran for state treasurer. And now I'm running for governor. And uh, as I travel the state, the things I see remind me of my childhood. I see factories that have been abandoned and are, are shut down. I see roads and bridges that are falling apart, families that are struggling to find health insurance. And I see, uh, I see pay people in towns that have just been left behind, frankly, by a bunch of politicians who just don't care. And that's one of the problems we have in Ohio. We have a bunch of politicians who spend more time trying to fill the pockets of the special interests than they do about creating jobs. And that is not the direction we should be going in Ohio. That is not the Ohio that I want to see for the future of my community, of my children, and every community and every child in this state. So the future I want to see is one where every child can have a great education, 
where our infrastructure is excellent and it includes high-speed internet access all across Ohio. And the Ohio I want to see is one where uh, health care is a right and not a privilege and we re where we grow the, uh, a new middle class with the jobs of the 21st century. And we have all the tools we need to make this happen. We do. We're a great state. We have all the tools we need to make this happen, but what we lack is leadership. I spent eight years on active duty in the Air Force. I got the best leadership training in the world. And if there's one thing I learned, it's that leadership changes everything. That's why I have a plan to, um, to make our schools the best in the nation. That's why I have a plan to create a public option for health care in Ohio so that no one has to go without health insurance. That's why I have a plan uh, to re revitalize our economy and be ready for the uh, jobs of the 21st century. That's why I have a plan to uh, join the U.S. Climate Alliance to protect our environment. We have tools. I have leadership. I have a vision, and that's why I'm running for governor. And in this, the... Uh, and in this kind of setting today at the City Club, I think it's most appropriate that I continue to hear what people want to say. And that's why I want to make a lot of this program uh, about a conversation. Because the, the, the solutions that I've been crafting are in response to the concerns that people share with me as I travel this state. And I do want to hear what you have to say in this room, too. So I'm going to open it up for questions. And I guess I'll welcome Dan back up on the stage. Maybe I'll stay that, here. That was way quicker than I anticipated. Yeah. All right. So. Um, I, I was advised long ago that uh, a, a short speech is the best. Right? Yeah, that's yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry that's, no, no, that's quite all right. So today we're enjoying a forum in our Ohio 2018 Meet the Candidates series, a conversation with Connie Pillich, Democratic candidate for governor of Ohio. We are about to begin the Q&A, and we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our webcast or our Facebook Live video. If you'd like to tweet a question, you can tweet it at the City Club or with the hashtag City Club, and our staff will work it into the program. You can also leave it in the comments section of the Facebook Live feed, and we will work it in as well. Holding our microphone today is our membership and customer service manager, Corey Isler. May we have our first question. As a fan of Northeast Ohio, I understand that people aren't going to stay in Ohio or come back to Ohio without jobs. There are those that say that government can't make jobs, that the private sector has to provide jobs. So what could your administration do to provide more jobs to attract and retain people in Ohio? Well, that's a fabulous question uh, for the main uh, reason that jobs is my number one, growing jobs is my number one priority. And when, I, when I'm in office on my first cabinet meeting, I'm going to tell this to my cabinet. I'm going to say our number one priority is to grow good paying jobs in Ohio. And we're going to work as a team to make this happen. And we have to start with education. Education's got to be number one because the only way I can bring in new jobs of uh, the 21st century is to have a, a workforce with the right skills. And the only way our workforce is going to be ready, our young people are going to be ready, is if I give them the educational skills and tools that they need starting at the very earliest age. Second, we have to rebuild our infrastructure. Uh, and infrastructure really is the only way that government does create jobs because government builds the roads uh, and government builds the infrastructure. But when I'm talking about infrastructure, I don't mean just roads and bridges. I also mean access to high-speed internet all across the state. Unfortunately, that is still a problem uh, in Ohio, and some of those places are not that far from this room where we sit today. And I don't know how we can compete in the 21st century if we don't have access to the internet. Third, we have to support our startups, those small uh, enterprises and creative ventures that probably begin on somebody's dining room table like my law firm did, and, uh, but, but with the right help from the state, such as a one-stop shop for guidance or third frontier funds to, to help spur uh, creativity. Those enterprises can grow into tomorrow's Google or tomorrow's Microsoft. Uh, fourth, we have to help our homegrown Ohio businesses, those small and medium-sized firms that are uh, 
that are invested in Ohio because they live here. They've got roots in our state, and they could be on the cusp of growing if only they had uh, a workforce with the right skills or the capital to buy that next piece of equipment that they need. And the state can help with both of those things. And then finally, the jobs of the 21st century. Advanced manufacturing, additive manufacturing, renewable energy, and so on. These are the, the opportunities of the 21st century. And these are the places where we have to concentrate our investments and our energy and our effort. Now, I know that there is a long history of special interests holding out their hands, waiting for their little gifts. But I'm going to instead make smart investments to grow the economy for all of Ohio. Connie, sometimes when people run for state office, they concentrate on the three C's, mm -hmm. Columbus, Cincinnati, Cleveland, or those media markets. I read in the Plain Dealer where you have an 88-county strategy. Can you mm -hmm. tell us exactly what that means? Yeah, I'm happy to. And, and I'm assuming this, this carries as I walk around. OK. So uh, look, for a long time, uh, really members of both parties have ignored large sections of our state. And it really shows. Uh, so I decided that we need to do something different. That's why I have an 88-county strategy, because I don't want to leave anybody behind, whether it's on my campaign trail or under my administration. And everywhere I go, people tell me they want leadership and they want solutions. And uh, I draw upon my mission-focused leadership training that I, got, that I got in the Air Force, and that's helping me craft solutions to these problems. That's why I have a five-point jobs plan that I just talked about. Uh, to revitalize our economy. That's why I introduced an education stimulus plan to make our schools the best in the nation, to give our kids the tools they need. That's why when Anthem and Blue, uh, Anthem and Premier Health, pardon me, uh, announced that they're leaving the insurance exchange in Ohio, I proposed a public option for health care in Ohio. Uh, no matter where you live, you should be able to get health care. So my public option would let anybody buy Medicaid or the state employees health insurance program. And I don't really care what the insurance companies say. I want to make sure people have health care. This is the solution. And when uh, Donald Trump announced we're going to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord, I announced that we should join the US Climate Alliance, which is a coalition of states who pledged to do our part to live up to the terms of that accord. But by doing that, we get to take advantage of the explosive growth in the renewable energy uh, industry, which is growing 12 times faster than the rest of the entire economy. Now, we could sit back and watch other states jump ahead, or we could lead. And the only way we're going to lead is by listening to what the people say and by taking uh, these opportunities by the horn and pushing them through. And that's what I want to do. Hello. Uh, you kind of led into my question. Um, yesterday, Administrator Pruitt you know, announced the rollback or the withdrawal of the Clean mm -hmm. Power Plan, which would reduce um, power plant emissions of carbon. Um, at our state legislature, there's been a big push, a big fight against our renewable energy standards. Um, to his credit, yeah, Governor yeah. Kasich has you know, vetoed that um, effort at the end of last year, but it continues to be a pretty big battle. So um, if you're governor, how do you work with a supermajority Republican legislature to, um, I'm assuming you're in favor of renewable energy, as you just said, how do you yeah. um, ensure that that um, continues on here and uh, you know, state action is all more important than ever given the mm -hmm. inaction of the go uh, federal government? So, so what are some of your plans to address climate and energy issues? Well, thank you so much for asking that question. Uh, I grew up a half a mile from Lake Erie. And we would spend a, a great summer's afternoon uh, on the, uh, at the beach. My mom would take us five kids. We'd all uh, hold hands as we crossed the busy road. We'd go down the path, and there was the sand, and there was the water. But I also remember uh, when Lake Erie turned orange because of the slag the steel mill dumped into it. And so because of these experiences and because of my love of the outdoors and natural spaces, I'm resolved to doing everything I can to protect all our natural spaces, including our fragile Lake Erie. Growing the economy and protecting the environment are not mutually exclusive. The first bill I introduced in the legislature uh, would require sustainable building techniques and energy efficient operation if we spent capital dollars, your money, to build a new building in Ohio. And when I introduced this bill, it was uh, what I learned uh, is 
is that you can work with industry and you can work uh, to protect the environment at the same time because two people came into my office to talk to me about this bill. Uh, one was a representative from the Sierra Club and one was the president of the Ohio Chemistry Technology Council. One would think that these two groups are diametrically opposed, but there are many things that we can work together on. And that was one example. Another example was implementing and creating the uh, renewable energy portfolio standards in the first place with a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature. And those things happened because we had leadership that started to think about where, where are things going in the future? Where can we uh, improve the industry, especially uh, in the northwestern part of the state where we have uh, a great uh, opportunity, we have a great resource called wind. Uh, unfortunately, the legislature has changed a little bit and there have been some battles. Uh, I am very um, proud of Governor Kasich for standing up to them and for vetoing the, the, the rollback of those measures. However, they have been weakened over time, so I'm definitely going to work to strengthen them. And the way you work to strengthen these people is you, uh, to strengthen these standards is you, you, you bring in evidence and you talk to people about how this can impact their community and their district and how it can strengthen our state. Because really, growing the economy and protecting the environment are not mutually exclusive. Uh, and I'm going to do that. I'm very proud that I have been endorsed by the Sierra Club and all of my previous campaigns. And I'm going to do everything I can to protect Ohio and our environment. And I'm, we're going to live up to our, uh, do our part to, to protect our climate. He's right behind me. Are you sure? Hi, how are you? First, I wanted to say thank you for your service. Um, and we appreciate all that you're doing in terms of also running. Mm -hmm. My question was more about the education. We at this table actually were talking a little bit about there have been improvements in the elementary schools, uh, but it's pretty significant in terms of as you look at Ohio compared to the global industry, um, global countries, and oh, some man. of their performance versus our children. And so I wanted to know a little bit about your vision and plan that you talked a little bit about, mm -hmm. because it's not just competing in the United States. We are competing you know, globally, mm -hmm. as you talked about, you know, getting internet access and doing those types of mm -hmm. things. These are the types of things we've got to prepare our children. And I think it's pretty scary and daunting when you think about some of the skills, unfortunately, that we're not passing out from a graduation rate. We're seeing some improvements, but they're not enough. So I'm curious what your plan has to do. Yeah. I, I can't thank you enough for that question because it is uh, very important to me. Uh, over the last seven years, Ohio's education system has fallen from fifth in the nation to 22nd. And that we're going the wrong way. We need to be changing that around. And that is a result of the deliberate and intentional steps taken by the GOP in Columbus to undermine our public schools. And so uh, that's, why, uh, that's why I introduced my education stimulus plan just a few weeks ago. Uh, I think education is key. We have to give our kids the tools they need. This is a changing economy. We are a global economy. You hit the nail on the head. And we have to give our kids the tools they need. So I'm going to start with universal pre-K. Kids got to be ready to, to learn when they get into kindergarten. And having uh, all the studies show that starting early is better for children. Uh, second, our, um, we have to have a balanced K through 12 curriculum that has a focus on the STEM fields because we live in 2017. Technology is critically important no matter what you do with your career. And by having a strong curriculum, we're going to make sure our kids are ready to go right into the workforce, to go into a skilled apprenticeship program, uh, go to a community college, or go into a uh, a four-year institution of higher learning. And yes, my plan does include a means to make college debt free for our students. I really want to emphasize that workforce training because that's going to be uh, really important because, um, because of the nature of the way that the economy is changing and where the opportunities are today and in the very short-term future for skilled workers. We're going to make sure that we, we provide that. For our teachers, I want to make sure they have the best training that we can give them, have strong mentorships, uh, have uh, constructive and effective evaluations, and administer fewer standardized tests. And for our taxpayers, I want to make sure that, uh, <laughs> that we address the funding formula that's not been addressed for, oh, it's over 20 years now, right? And we have to retool that. It's just not fair. 
uh, that we ignore what the Supreme Court told us. And the Supreme Court told us that the state has to take a greater role in paying for our system of common schools. That doesn't mean we leave local communities out of it, but we should be taking a greater role in it. And unfortunately, over the last seven years, I think the number is something like 92% of communities have had to come get new money, not replacement money, new money uh, to pay for their schools because the GOP has taken away their money. So this is a huge problem. And so, but I also want to uh, talk about our charter schools uh, because uh, we, have, um, we have an unregulated charter school system in Ohio. And uh, Public Education Partners reports that um, of the 400 charter schools we have in Ohio, 376 of them are failing. So the good news is we have 24 that are doing a great job, they're filling an important niche, and they're doing a great service. Uh, they should be a model, but 376 of them are failing. And I'm not going to put up with that. When I'm governor, if you're running a charter school that's failing, I'm going to shut you down because that is a waste of our money. But I also, also want to comment on this. There are a lot of factors in our communities that affect the ability of children to learn. These are factors of poverty, food security, uh, unstable housing, uh, low wages, drug addiction. These are very much school problems. And it's not that we can solve them in the schools, but they bring those problems into the schools, and they are not, these children are not ready to, le to learn. So we have to, uh, we have to remember this is part of our future to, to work as hard as we can to remedy these problems. And one uh, step that I'm going to take is to create community learning centers, which do bring uh, access to certain services to the children while they're in school. And they are community run, so whatever your community thinks you need, that's what we're going to do. Uh, so I think education is key, and I'm going to make this a cornerstone, not of just my campaign, but of my governorship. Connie, uh, you know, Governor Kasich had spent a lot of time pushing responsibilities onto local governments and school districts. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm cutting taxes, and then he pushes it on down. That's been counterproductive. Cities and states, uh, cities and counties are functions and, and a child of a state government. What can we do about that? Because they're getting, they're getting pushed and the mayors say nothing. They just expect more. <laughs> I think that's a little dishonest. Well, I'm, 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 I'm glad to have that question too because, you know, um, sometimes people uh, lump all government together. And there are different levels of government. Here in Ohio, we don't print money. We can only spend what we bring in. So if we bring in this much in revenue, we can only spend, we have to spend no more than this much. But what has happened over the last seven years is that the, uh, the politicians in Columbus have given big tax breaks to the wealthy and handouts to the special interests. Yet, people still want services. So, uh, so what, do, what do they do to balance the, bu the state budget? Well, let's think about this. You want to walk down your street uh, in safety, with, with secure in the belief that you got enough cops on the beat, mm -mm -mm -mm. they took money from, the, from your local cops. Boom, right here. You want to think that there's going to be someone to respond to your 911 call when you have an emergency. Nope, they took money from them too. You want to make sure your kids have enough uh, textbooks and teachers in the classroom. They took money from that too. Boom. Uh, you want to have social workers who can take care of uh, abused children. Too bad. Boom, that's funding some more tax breaks up here. You want to pave your roads. Sorry, we're using it up here at the state level, and on and on and on. That's how they've balanced the budget, by taking it from the very services that you require. So think about this. We don't want to think about government. We want government to do its job. We want the basic services, the things that come right up to our front porch to keep our community safe. Let grandma have someone to, to call in case she falls in the middle of the night. Make sure that child who's, been, who's uh, homeless or is in a tough situation has some resources to finally make it. Make sure that pothole on our street that broke our car wheel a few days ago is going to be fixed. These are the basic services that we expect government to do. And it's not able to do it because John Kasich and the GOP legislature has taken that money and put it at the state level to pay for tax breaks for billionaires. And we've got to change our priorities, and I'm going to do that. What, what we do, the remedy for this, is leadership. Like I said, this leadership changes everything. 
That it sets the priorities, and those are the priorities of the people in charge right now, and we're going to change that, and we're going to make sure that government can do the very basic things that we expect it to do. Hi. Uh, my question was manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, Ohio has rich manufacturing backbone. Are these jobs lost forever, or there's something the state can do to bring them back? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, uh, we do live in a changing economy, and we are a global economy. But uh, we are going to be making things in the United States for quite a long while yet. And I want to make sure they make them here in Ohio. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the priorities of the current administration in Ohio has not been doing that. We lag the nation in job growth for more than four and a half years. And at the same time, the politicians support a tax code that encourages companies to pack up and ship, out, ship their jobs out of state or out of the country. And those are not the priorities that we need to have. We need to have investments so that our economy grows for everyone. That's why I'm investing in workforce training, uh, workforce development. I call it education. But we want to make sure our, our communities, our, our young people have the skills they need. For here, a great example right here in Cleveland is Cuyahoga Community College, which has an incredible, uh, has the only additive, uh, additive manufacturing or, or 3D printing program in the state. And they can't, they can't keep the seats filled. They've got virtually a 100% placement rate. Same with their welding program, which uh, is a lot more than using a blowtorch. It's a very technical program. Uh, uh, and they, they have trouble keeping it filled because they, the placement rate is so high. And these are good paying jobs, jobs you can support a family on. Those are, that's what I'm talking about, workforce training, workforce development. We do have a manufacturing back, backbone, and I'm really proud of that. We know how to make things, and we want to make things here in Ohio. We have uh, an unparalleled work ethic. We've got the manufacturing infrastructure. We've got capacity that could be redeveloped. And that's a lot cheaper to redevelop existing infrastructure than it is to create new. But what we need is a relentless advocate, a leader who's going to go out and make sure that Ohio is at the top of the list. Right now, there are Fortune 50 companies who are planning to build new facilities in Ohio. Probably a lot of the people in this room have heard about, pardon me, build new facilities in the, in the United States. And a lot of us have probably heard about uh, Amazon doing this. Ohio needs to be on the top of every list of consideration. And the only way we're going to do that is by making sure we have an educated workforce, we've got great infrastructure, we have the capacity, and we have a relentless advocate who's going to go out and sell our state and bring those jobs here. That's what we're going to do. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more on your um, reference to debt-free college. How do you hope to make college more affordable? Yeah, well, as a, as a mom who has sent two kids to college, I know exactly how expensive it is. And uh, we, are, we now are done with that, so we're excited about having a, a small pay raise because of that. <laughs> uh, I was able to put myself through college with an ROTC scholarship. And uh, I supported myself during college with student loans and part-time work. Uh, and when I graduated, I entered active duty. My service was in exchange for my education. And while I was very honored to wear the uniform of our country, I think we have to be honest about this. If the only way our children can pay for college is by putting their lives on the line, I think we have a problem. That's why in my education stimulus plan, I do have a means to make college debt free for those middle class Ohioans who live and work in Ohio for 10 years post-graduation from a public institution. When they live and work here for 10 years, they are investing in our community, they are contributing, they're paying taxes, we hope they're having children and buying homes. This is how we not only uh, uh, get paid back for this, but this is how we excite people and get them to come to Ohio. And for those who want to go into public service, I have a means to, uh, to assist them. I've always been drawn to public service, and that's why I went to the military, and I've continued in public service in, in my career. And there are a lot of people that, that we want to have go into public service, and I have a means to make that, uh, that, um, that possible through uh, a partnership with the Ohio uh, Nonprofit Association and creating a public service corps, uh, perhaps using the John Glenn Institute. 
as well as part of that. Uh, but not everybody's going to go to college. Uh, some people want to go into the workforce and maybe in the skilled trades, which is why I started talking about having workforce training. We've got to have, uh, th there are so many jobs available in the skilled trades and in the skilled work, uh, uh, work industries. And we have to make sure that we uh, support those uh, work training programs. And I'm also going to create incentives for businesses to hire people in those skilled, from those skilled apprenticeship programs. And if we institute my plan, we're going to deliver the best education in the country. That's what we're going to do. Well, let me ask a question that's explicitly political, if I may. Um, at the national level, the Democratic Party is uh, uh, divided between people who think that the focus needs to be on reclaiming the voters that we lost mm -hmm. in the last election and those who believe that the key is to uh, appeal to our base as a party, and they see those things as mm -hmm. perhaps complementary, but perhaps in competition with each other. So as a candidate for office, the, the top office in a state that turned blue in the last presidential election, do you have a strategy for trying to, I'm sorry, turn red. I got those colors mixed up, sorry. Do you have a strategy for how you, how you try to do both of those things? Well, sure. Uh, I think it's very uh, clear that uh, the Democratic Party didn't, didn't reach voters l uh, last year. November's election results were very, uh, very apparent. And I think with the first thing we have to do to win in a state like Ohio, uh, my home and yours, is we have to show up. There are so many parts of the state that have not seen Democrats for a very long time, and it's very evident when we go there. They don't know who we are. That's why I have an 88-county strategy. That's why I've already been to 67 counties in this state, and I plan to visit all of them in the, in the near future. And as I travel, uh, well, I'll talk about what I hear. Well, uh, I think the second thing we have to think we have to provide is we have to stand for something. As I'm traveling the state, I do hear people saying, what, what do Democrats stand for? I don't know what you stand for. I didn't hear a message. I haven't heard a message in years. I thought you were the party that supported working families, but I don't know anymore because I haven't heard from you in a long time. So we have to show up and we have to stand for something. And everywhere I go, people do tell me they want leadership and they want solutions. And that's why my campaign is based on solutions, solutions to the problems that people talk to me about. Uh, everywhere I go, uh, who was it who talked to me? Um, Mr. Sweeney talked about uh, the, the inability of local governments to pay for things. I hear that in every single place I have been without exception. Every single place. Government can't do what it's supposed to do. You know what else I hear? Jobs. We don't have any jobs. Our jobs have left. Nobody's doing anything to help our jobs and wages. And well, that's true. We lag the entire country in job creation over the last four and a half years. No wonder people are feeling left behind. The other thing we're seeing is that um, uh, people are, this has been very surprising, people are very worried about health care. That's why I, I propose a public option for our health care in Ohio so that anybody can buy Medicaid or the state employees health insurance program. We can, uh, I don't care what the insurance companies say, I want to make sure Ohioans have health care. We've been following the failed policies for a long time right now of these promises of tax cuts which benefit the wealthy and do nothing but increase the burden of the rest of us. And what do we have to show for it? Well, like I said, job growth lagging for four and a half years, top five uh, in the country for infant mortality, top three for food insecurity, number one in opioid deaths. This is not what we should be doing, folks. What we have here is a seven and a half year experiment of what not to do. We have to do something different. And that's why my campaign is based on going everywhere and standing for solutions that are in response to the problems people have shared with me all over the state. And if we do that, we're going to bring home some votes. Our next question we're going to take from Twitter, actually. What challenges have you faced as a woman in government, and how will that shape your governance? Well, that's real interesting. Uh, uh, I am a woman, and I have been in government. Uh, getting elected was always the, uh, always the key. I guess I have always been, uh, I always find myself in uh, 
fields that are not uh, traditional to women. I went into the military and that was, I was the only kid in my high school that did that and obviously at that point the only girl. Um, I, I do uh, I do recall having to sometimes defend the rights of women to even join the military. That's, that was a, a common complaint back in the old days. Of course, it's a whole lot different now because women are uh, allowed to do most jobs in the military and uh, especially in the Air Force. I'm very proud of my service, uh, my branch of the, of the service, in, in providing those opportunities. But uh, the challenges that I think I have uh, balancing uh, my family, having uh, a little bit of a younger family when I first started. Uh, thank goodness for me, I was uh, running at the local level and it was not so hard on my children or my husband. But I do think that the, um, uh, in 2017, times are a lot different. We have seen a woman in Ohio serve as the Speaker of the House. We have seen a woman in Ohio as the ranking member on the Finance Committee, the most powerful committee uh, in the state legislature. We have seen a woman in our country get the nomination of a major political party to, uh, for president of the United States. And I think we're going to continue to see a lot more women running. Uh, look at the Democratic, look at this gubernatorial primary. Half of the candidates are women. And I really don't think that's what defines us though. Uh, because I think that glass ceiling has been shattered now. I think it's a, a whole different a situation from perhaps when I was a, a girl and didn't really have role models to look up to. Uh, I think what's more important is that I do my work, I'm accessible to my constituents, I focus on the issues that they're bringing to me that are their concerns, and that I think about long term in the future. You know, as an attorney, I'm trained to try to think of the contingencies for my clients and make sure we protect them in their contracts or in their work flat policies or uh, in, in whatever case I'm, I'm trying to bring. And as a, someone, uh, as, as a business owner and as someone who has an MBA, we were trained to think about how to build for the future and how to prepare for the future. And those are the things I try to bring to the table as, as a candidate and as a, as a public servant. Good afternoon. Um, as you know, immigrants have a tendency to work very hard and take advantage of all the opportunities that are given to them, and they could be a tremendous economic stimulus. Uh, I was wondering, uh, what plans do you have to encourage more immigration to Ohio, and particularly in terms of refugees? I believe Governor Kasich signed a letter at one point um, in support of discouragement of refugees or something like that. Oh. Well, that's really interesting. Obviously, uh, immigration is, uh, by our Constitution, a federal issue. But there are a number of things we can do in, in, in this state uh, to try to encourage uh, immigration reform. We do need, look, we need a comprehensive immigration reform. And the, the failure to do this by the people who are in charge in Washington is just a symptom of, of political grandstanding and uh, folks not trying to lead. Uh, when, we, when we address immigration reform, I think we need to be very aware of the impact that immigrants have on our communities, on our, uh, on our economy, on our agriculture, on our uh, institutions of higher learning, on our health care systems. We have immigrants everywhere, and probably everyone in this room has uh, an ancestor who immigrated to this, this country at one point or another. Some more recently, like ours, you know, our, my grandparents were immigrants, uh, and some maybe a little bit more distantly, maybe a, a few, few generations before that. Uh, we have to, but I do, one thing I did like about what Governor Kasich said uh, was when he was talking about the dreamers, those children who were brought here by their parents, and this is where they live. This is where they grew up. This is where they've gone to school, and they've, they've been in the school clubs, they've played on the school soccer teams, they've been in, uh, um, babysitters and, and taking care of their community. Uh, and the fact that uh, Governor Kasich would like to welcome them to Ohio I think is a, a, a really interesting and intriguing idea because I want to make sure Ohio grows. I want to have the best of the best in Ohio. I want young people to come live here and I want to make sure they have opportunities. And I think we can do these things if we uh, have some leadership. It all comes down to leadership, folks. If we have leadership, people who want to lead and are going to put away the political footballs and think about the long term. What does our country need to grow? How can we make this uh, um, a circumstance 
that helps our community, helps our state, and protects our nation at the same time. Hi. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about uh, women's health issues, um, mm -hmm. especially in light of the fact that Ohio has become, under Governor Kasich, uh, increasingly restrictive on abortion and reproductive health um, access for women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, I do have an inside line to that because I am a woman. And I'm the mother of a woman and the daughter of a woman. So I do, I do have some, I have some personal knowledge about, about women's health. And I have to tell you that I really trust women to know what's best for them and to make their own medical decisions. I trust doctors to practice medicine and to know the best uh, course of action to advise their patients. I don't trust the government to make these decisions. And I think that is all I really need to say. Uh, you touched upon your health care plan. Can you go into a little bit more detail and also talk about the opioid crisis? Yes, I absolutely can. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, my health care plan in general first. Um, a healthy Ohio is really important to me, not just as a, a quality of life issue, but it's an economic issue too. The only way I can grow the economy is if I have a healthy workforce. And so that's a, that's, this is something that's very important to me. And when I talk about a healthy Ohio, I always start with healthy communities. That means we have to have healthy school lunches, food security, and clean water. I want to uh, strengthen Medicaid by uh, creating um, competitive bidding so that your dollars that are funding Medicaid are spent the most efficient way and the most effective way possible. And I want to fight to retain Medicaid expansion, because without it, 700,000 Ohioans will lose their health insurance. 26,000 of them are veterans. 700,000 Ohioans, 26,000 veterans. And we will lose a quarter of our hospitals. Think of the impact that is. A quarter of the hospitals in Ohio. That's a huge impact on our state. Also, to further uh, health, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk now about my public option, and then I'll talk about the opioid crisis. So for, uh, I decided that it was important for us to have a public option. So health care has been uh, brought up on the campaign trail time and time again. And I expected to hear it maybe among Democratic activists, but I hear it from everybody. I, hear it, I heard it from the couple in the diner in Ironton. I heard it from a guy I talked to at the American Legion Post in Coshocton. I hear it everywhere. Uh, it, people are terrified, uh, or, or at least very worried, that Congress is going to take away, take away their health insurance, and they're going to be very vulnerable, and something's going to go wrong. Or maybe they had something go wrong in the past, so they have a pre-existing condition. They're very worried about it. So uh, all of this unrest, because we have got, we've got no leadership taking charge of this in, in, in Washington, so that's created a lot of unrest and uncertainty in the insurance markets in Ohio. Already Premier Health and um, Anthem have announced they're going to leave the marketplace in Ohio. And so 20 co counties or even more could be without health insurance. And I think that's terrible. So my proposal is to place a public option on the marketplace, on the exchange, so that no, uh, no matter where you live, you could buy uh, Medicaid or the uh, Public Employees Health Insurance Program. And so let's talk about what that means. Um, first of all, it wouldn't cost any of us a dime, because these systems already exist. All we would do is structure who's eligible to get into them. It wouldn't cost taxpayers any money because these are people who are buying insurance. And my, re my plan has been very well received by hospitals, doctors, nurses, small business owners. They embrace it. Doctors who have a bit large Medicaid practices do embrace it because they think it would lower the risk for them and maybe eventually could raise their reimbursements. So I think it's a, a real positive opportunity for us. But now let's talk about the opioid crisis, because this is the largest public health crisis of the century. 
and it is devastating to our state. It's affecting every single community in our state. I think we have to attack it from all sides, prevention, treatment, and enforcement. And my first line of prevention is to make sure people have a good job, a job that gives you the dignity of work, the ability to support your family, something to, to, to live for, to fight for, and a sense of community. And in addition to that line of prevention, we have to use every means available to us to educate people about the dangers and the horrific addiction that comes from using these opioids and heroin. We gotta stop people from using them in the first place. But some people that doesn't work on, they, they're already on the road to addiction and caught up in this horrible place. So um, uh, we, have to, we have to have treatment, effective treatment. That means we have to keep those Medicaid dollars flowing. We have to fight to keep Medicaid expansion because Medicaid dollars are paying for the treatment of thousands of Ohioans right now. And without that treatment, goodness knows where they'll go. Um, and, that, and, we, and for enforcement, we have to, uh, look, I want these drugs off our streets, out of our state. I want the dealers and the pushers put in jail. But we have to restore funding to the people in the trenches fighting it, the police departments, the sheriff's deputies. Is it any wonder that we have this crisis when their resources have been diminished over the last seven years? Number one in opioid deaths. That's got to change. We've got to attack it from all sides. Um, good afternoon. I want to say I very much agree with you. I think Ohio voters are very much looking for political leadership, and I don't think this state can be great without great political leadership. And so I was wondering if you would share with us um, what, how you define your, your leadership style, and in particular, um, your ability to make tough decisions. Because mm -hmm. if, as we've heard from you this afternoon, there's a lot of big ticket items out there. Economic growth, education, healthcare, these seem to be your priorities. But there's also the question of resources, and I don't mm -hmm. think tax increases can solve everything. So when it comes down to it in your administration, how are you going to make those tough decisions, and what are mm -hmm. you going to choose to prioritize? Thank you. Thanks. Well. Uh, let me start by saying I'm going to use all the, all the skills I've had the opportunity to develop across my career, starting with my military training. You know, in the Air Force, you learn to work with everybody. They're from all walks of life. And there was never a Republican way or a Democratic way of doing things. There was just the right way. You were mission focused. My job was to get here. And even though somebody said I had to go this way to get here, and others said I had to go that way to get here, I just know I needed to get there. We're going to find the best way to get there. Making tough decisions, I've had plenty in my time. I've had to, uh, I've had to discipline people as, as a, as a well, I have 15 years of executive experience. I've had to discipline people. I had to uh, push one of my airmen out of the Air Force because of drug use. I've had to um, reassign people. I've had to, I've hired people and I've fired people as a business owner. Uh, as a legislator, we made some very tough decisions in 2009, when we passed the budget that was in the throes of the, of the recession, and remember I talked, well, I talked about how we can only spend as much as we brought in. We didn't bring in that much. We had to cut $2 billion from our operating budget, and that was not easy, making cuts. But what we, what we did was we prioritized. And the budget is a statement of our priorities. We prioritized investments in the things that we thought would help pull us out of the recession in the long term. And they were the right decisions, investing in education and in infrastructure. Infrastructure so we could put people back to work in a very short, in a very short term. Education to build for the long term. And, and those, uh, those were very successful. Uh, and in, uh, you know, in the legislature, there's always something in every bill that you don't like. That's, that's why we have compromises. And you have to weigh, do I want to support this part of the bill because I really like it, or do I want to support this part of the bill, or do I want to oppose the bill because there's really something I don't like, and you have to make those tough, tough decisions all the time. I've done that, and I'll continue to do that again. A simple question, but maybe not a simple answer. Where do you stand on gun control? Oh, OK. <laughs> Gosh, I'll tell you, at this, uh, at this juncture, with the horrific tragedy in Las Vegas, uh, and it's not the only one we've had. We've had Orlando. We've had Newtown. Chardon, uh, San Bernardino, and now Las Vegas, uh, tragedy after tragedy, uh, make it very hard to understand what could possess a madman or, or, to, or madmen 
to do those things. I do, uh, I do support uh, sensible, uh, sensible reforms, keeping guns out of the uh, hands of terrorists and felons, uh, making sure that we close the background check, uh, background, uh, check loophole that's allowing guns to flow freely. I do support uh, uh, Sherrod Brown's um, proposal that the NRA also supports to uh, prohibit uh, bump stock weapons. Those, that's the, that's the uh, weapon that the shooter in Las Vegas used that allowed him to shoot 100 rounds a minute. Boom, 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 boom. There's no reason for us to have those. They put our community at risk. And look, we deserve, we are Americans. We deserve to be able to walk down our streets in safety, to go to a public event in safety. And I know we have a lot of different opinions and different priorities among individual selves. But there's one priority and there's one opinion that I do think we share, and it's the fact that we want to come together when it's necessary and fight for the most important things and fight for our most important freedoms. Um, I, I, I'm, right now I'm reading um, a biography of Alexander Hamilton and he's talking about how these 13 colonies, they all had their different things and getting them to come together was a kind of a monumental task. But the only way we could survive as a nation, uh, both in commerce, in economy, and in security, was if we came together. And we have to do that as a nation. And again, we need leadership. I don't want to hear any more of the same old stories. I don't want to, I mean, my, I don't want to hear any more excuses, but we have to take action to make sure that those types of weapons do not fall into the wrong hands and that we come together to prevent future tragedies as best we can. Well done. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to get that. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been enjoying a forum uh, in our Ohio 2018 Meet the Candidates series. Today's was a conversation with Connie Pillich, Democratic candidate for governor of Ohio. Our community partner for our forum today is the League of Women Voters. Additionally, we welcome students from Flow Homeschool Co-op, as well as their parents slash teachers. Student participation in City Club forums is, made, uh, is provided by many foundations, including the William E. Weiss Foundation, and we thank all of you for being here today. That brings us to the end of our program. Thank you, Ms. Pillich. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on Ideastream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Payne Fund, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland, Incorporated.